Sustainable Places Research Institute, which have jointly organized what promises to be a very lively debate on the future of our food. My name is Roberta Sonino. I'll be chairing the debate tonight. I'm a senior member of staff in the School of Planning and Geography. Uh, we have a, a very uh, interesting uh, set of speakers here a mix of academics and non-academics ready to give us their view about what should be on our menu and what's the future of our food. So we are still waiting for, we know there are major traffic jams around Cardiff, so we are still waiting for one of the speakers. But uh, what I'll do in a second is to briefly introduce the first three at least. Um, and then I'll hand over to them directly to speak for about five to ten minutes about what they do. And I also ask them at the very last minute to tell us what they think should be on our menu and why in two sentences. At the end of this, we'll uh, open it up for questions and answers. So uh, the speakers who are already here, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce them again, uh, familiar faces to some of us, Katie Palmer from Public Health Wales and also the, one of the Sustainable Food Cities coordinator, uh, Dr. Anna Moraghi, Faust from the School of Planning and Geography, uh, researcher on many aspects of sustainable food systems, especially food security, and we have Jeremy Seagrove, a research fellow in uh, public health here in the School of Social Sciences. So uh, if I can ask Katie first to give us a five, ten minute presentation about her work, her role, what she thinks needs to be on the menu for the future. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, the organization that I um, work for is Food Cardiff. Um, um, and that's situated um, in partnership with Cardiff Liverpool University Health Board, um, with Cardiff University, um, and with uh, City of Cardiff Council. I'm actually going to cheat a bit now um, because I went to um, City University's symposium just before Christmas, which was jointly organised with the um, Food Research Collaboration um, on sustainable diets, and I wanted to share with you some of the take-home messages that I um, got from that, um, from that day. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to highlight some of the, um, some of the key messages from some of the speakers um, and then go on to talk a little bit about um, the Sustainable Food Cities Network and Food Cardiff. So one of the messages that I took away was that we can't continue with business as usual in our current um, food system. Um, one example of that was that um, we, if we carry on as business by, if with usual, we're going to contribute two degrees of global warming um, just through agriculture by 2050. Um, the biodiversity and homogeneity um, of what we're growing and eating um, is quite staggering. So 86% of the world's calories come from just wheat, rice, maize, sugar, soya, barley, potatoes, and palm. Um, and what's quite frightening is that the areas where the most of this production is happening um, is the areas that are going to be hardest hit by any, um, any changes in climate. Um, Dr. Tara Garnett um, talked about food as a contested space. Um, she, she explained how there was no agreement on what un underpins the problems with our current food system. Is it that there's not enough food? Um, is the consumption pattern correct too much? too um, resource intensive um, and she talked about the inequity and the imbalances in the system that we have um, and one example of, um, of looking at this area as very contested is around meat consumption potentially yes meat consumption is um, a reduction in meat consumption will be good for our health will be good for the environment but what about jobs and livelihood and what about our culture of sitting around the table and having a Sunday meal Um, and also, um, Tara mentioned that should we be looking at um, situating food consumption within this broader discourse of sustainable consumption, so you know, what are we wearing, how are we travelling. Um, Jenny McDermott from the University of Aberdeen, um, the take-home message from her talk was that we need to be realistic 
um, about diets not idealistic. Um, we could reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by developing a healthy diet, but we'd be living on brown flakes and water. So some modelling that's been done um, shows that we would only be able to eat some food if we wanted to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by that. So we look at, need to look at modelling for an acceptable diet. Um, and an ideal diet isn't enough. It needs to be culturally, behaviourally, socially acceptable. And we need to consider the importance of, um, of inclusion and the social importance of eating. Um, Dr Peter Scarborough from Oxford University um, emphasised some of those points. He also talked about fruit and veg consumption um, and said that you know if we replace fruit and veg consumption with, um, or meat with fruit and veg, it will have a serious impact on health. But if you take meat out of the equation, are people going to replace it with fruit and veg? Or are they going to replace it with donuts? We don't know. Um, a very interesting talk from um, the Brazilian um, Ministry of Health talking about dietary guidelines. Um, they're looking at healthy diets that are derived from socially and environmentally um, sustainable food systems and looking at moving away from this nutrient-based approach. And they've proposed 10 steps, and some of these um, include fairly radical um, suggestions of making natural or minimally processed foods the basis of your diet, limiting the consumption of processed foods, avoiding the consumption of ultra-processed foods, eating regularly and carefully in an appropriate environment and wherever possible in company, and being wary of food advertising and marketing. Then we had a, a picture on, on governance, um, and Tony Long from the World Wildlife Fund um, and uh, from the European Policy in Brussels um, basically talked about the journey that they've taken looking at trying to get policy coherence at a European level, um, looking at how you integrate the waste, agriculture, health, nutrition, fish, food agendas. But it, was a, it wasn't a fruitful journey, and Europe has signaled that food, policy, that food policy doesn't belong at a European level. So Tony then went on to talk about, well, if it doesn't belong at a European level, <clears throat> how are we going to align our food agenda around current European thinking? So the European priorities are around the green economy, they're around fairness, and they're around global warming. Um, and constantly framed as Tony, and I quote Tony here on, um, around jobs, jobs, jobs. So we need to think how we can fit our agenda into the European agenda. And then finally, um, Professor Olivia de Chasseur from the uh, Centre of Philosophy of Law at the University of Louvain um, gave a, um, a half an hour talk. Um, and what I picked out from his talk was that he discussed very succinctly four lock-ins that we have in our current system that's preventing us from making progress from where we're at at the moment. And these lock-ins were, one was technologi um, technological, so how we developed our agricultural systems on a mass scale. Um, the second was socio-economic, um, how the food industry has become so globalised, we've got major um, companies dominating the market. Um, and that leading then to the third lock-in, which was political dominance. And the fourth lock-in then is a social cultural lock-in, which has been in part shaped by, by industry um, and is also shaped by, um, by our culture in terms of our the family structures, in terms of our behaviour, um, and in terms of everything being focused towards um, time and convenience. Olivia also discussed the, um, the fact that we need to look at food democracy that we need a space for social diversity. And one of the ways in which he talked about this was looking at how we look at new spaces <coughs> for developing um, new forms of governance. And one example of this was, was looking at the uh, using uh, food policy councils. So this brings me on to where we're situated with Food Cardiff within the Sustainable Food Cities Network. So the Sustainable Food Cities Network now has 36 cities. And in the absence of this policy and direction at European level or at national level, <coughs> what can we do as, food, as cities um, and, and regions to um, bring about change in our food system? Um, so Cardiff is part of this network. Um, 
and the network encourages cities to think about systems according to six areas. So these are promoting healthy and sustainable food to the public, tackling food poverty and diet related ill health and access to affordable food, building community food knowledge, skills and resources for projects, promoting a vibrant and diverse sustainable food economy, transforming catering and food procurement, and reducing waste in the ecological footprint of the food system. And these are, uh, these are um, reflected in our 10 principles of fair food, which is the Food Cardiff um, Charter there. So the, just to, to finish, I'd like to say the major challenges I've identi identified since working in Cardiff are how to change the unhealthy and unsustainable food environment when everything is driven by economics. How best to support communities, families, individuals to access healthy and affordable food um, in a climate of public sector cuts. And how we shift the culture of our unhealthy relationship with food um, into something that can be respected and celebrated. And in terms of what would be on the menu for me, um, would be people, relationships and partnerships, which are formed across different, different levels, um, different sectors. Um, and I think that for me the key to progressing this agenda within Cardiff in my, in my first year has all been about the people and the relationships that have been built. Um, and uh, on the side, as a, as a side serving, a good dose of energy, determination and also being a little bit bold. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to thank the organisers for inviting me to um, be able to be part of this panel today. Um, it is uh, a great pleasure to be able to share with you uh, some of the research we're doing here in the School of Planning and Geography, which has been doing research around food and sustainability and food systems for decades now and uh, working on different topics such as uh, farming strategies, sustainable rural development, uh, public procurement, looking at, at school food and, and hospital food, also looking at alternatives such as alternative food networks, uh, community food initiatives, and also we've been uh, lately quite engaged with uh, urban food and, and food security, and that's part of the work that I'm doing uh, right now. I'm part of um, participating in a European project where we're looking at the vulnerabilities of the European food system, trying to assess uh, what are those vulnerabilities and how can the European food system deliver food and nutrition security uh, for all. But also, as part of my research, I've been looking quite a lot into uh, civil society and, and collective action and working with uh, farmers, cooperatives and also buying groups and fair trade initiatives and, and uh, recently with food policy <coughs> councils and, and urban food strategies. So that's kind of like a bit uh, of my work. And, uh, through my work, what I, uh, what I try to go back when I, when I work on sustainable food systems is sometimes I go back to the, to the basics and, and in order to answer the question today, I was kind of thinking a bit about going back to the, um, to the three pillars of sustainability because what I think we need is a sustainable food um, in our menu. So um, going back a bit to these three pillars would be environment, economic and, and social aspects of sustainability. And if we think about environment, I think we see a lot of, uh, of debate around um, how the food system can be more environmentally sound, respecting um, ecological processes and so on. And there's quite a lot of focus on climate change and, and greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And I think it's important that we open up the environment beyond that and look at biodiversity and soil fertility and think about health as well because we want healthy ecosystems, healthy agroecosystems and healthy people and healthy animals. So um, if we go beyond that um, narrow approach to environment, we, we find much more things that are inside sustainability. And we go beyond as well to the focus sometimes on, on food production to see all the stages of the, of the food chain, thinking about uh, consumption but also transport and distribution and, and so on, and of course uh, waste, which is a big thing um, at the minute. In terms of environmental impact, but it connects us as well to the economic dimension of sustainability because we're wasting our money and we're wasting resources. So looking at this second dimension, we'll be looking at uh, how we can produce and we can transport and we can process and we can cook food in a way that is more efficient in terms of the resources that we're using and trying to internalize all the costs that are associated with that. 
but also if we think about the economic dimension of sustainability, thinking about affordability, people should be able to access good food, but also farmers should be able to have a fair return for the prices. And sometimes here, some tensions arise, how are we going to deal uh, with this? And also the workers in the food chain deserve uh, fair returns and, and salaries and safe working conditions. And this um, will link back to the last dimension of social sustainability, which it would be, um, well, trying to promote equity and social justice throughout the whole food chain. So that is that everybody is food secure, that we all have access to good, nutritious uh, food that allow us to have a healthy and hopefully happy life. Um, so um, that would be uh, the three uh, the three main pillars. And, and I think uh, through the way that I was explaining them, one of the, the key things that they, they are connected and it's important to look at them in, in, in their relationship. Because if we have a, a food system that is um, uh, socially and economically and ethically unacceptable for a large part of the population, it doesn't matter if we are being environmentally uh, sound, we're protecting the environment because it won't be resilient either way. And the same way around, if we have a system where we are able to um, uh, feed the world, but we are uh, relying on uh, natural resources uh, that we are not uh, protecting, then it won't be resilient anyway. So it is very important, in my view, to when we talk about our food menu, to try to connect these things. And furthermore, as Katie was saying, many of these aspects, uh, when we talk about sustainability, it is contested, it has trade-offs. Um, there are things that we have to decide. So uh, sustainability is also about democracy, it's about uh, having conversations, and it's about trying to tease out these trade-offs and how they look differently in different uh, places. Um, this uh, week I was telling to some of the students about the example of, of Malmo, that is a city that is, it has this uh, amazing target of <coughs> trying to be by 2020 uh, climate neutral in terms of emissions and they are introducing organic food in all of their school meals but they have problems in relation to their urban agriculture because they have a polluted land given that past in the type of industry they were having in their surrounding areas so uh, when they talk about local food they have issues in defining what local food is and how um, sustainable that local food is so this kind of shows the importance of, of having these conversations uh, locally and in context. And in this, in this sense, um, when I was going back to the question, what, what we should have in our plates, uh, there were two points that I wanted to highlight, and, and probably uh, coming from the academic side of the conversation, um, I think um, uh, they are uh, more important. Um, I think it is very important to democratize knowledge and to accept that knowledge is in many different places. That uh, here there are there's lots of research that is being produced around uh, sustainability and food, and it's very important to make that, no that knowledge accessible to people uh, in a way that it can be used. Not that it's uh, in a in a web page or in a journal article, but in a way that people can use it. And also accept that knowledge is not only in academic institutions, but it's in farmers, uh, other public institutions, activists, uh, civil society organizations, and so on. So it is very important that we are able to share and use this knowledge and create new knowledge that, that we need. And the second point, and I will finish that, is that it is also paramount that we improve participation and that everybody is part of this conversation. We are creating new spaces, which is a very exciting process, bringing new people to the table, but we have to make sure that those places are inclusive and we are hearing everyone and everyone can access those, those spaces. So in order to respond to Roberta's question, I would say that we need to have an open, inclusive, creative and democratic menu. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Thank you. To you. Yeah, well, well, thanks very much for the for the invitation. Um, I was talking to my, my children, uh, I think last night, and I was saying I was coming to talk at an event about food sustainability, and they, um, one of them said to me, "Well, do, do you know a lot about food sustainability?" And there was a kind of a, uh, a silence. So it was a bit of a trepidation that I was sort of preparing today, but it's been really interesting just to get a, get a sense of just how I guess interconnected the issues are. So I, I feel a bit more relaxed now. So I'm based in the uh, Decipher Centre. We're, we're a public health uh, research Centre of Excellence, and our aim really is to develop uh, and evaluate complex interventions to improve the health and well-being uh, of children and young people, and to take a socio-ecological approach, so to look at the interactions between different levels, between individuals, uh, families uh, and communities. And one of our priority areas is around uh, obesity, diet and, and physical activity, 
Um, we've done work on, on projects such as uh, the primary school uh, free breakfast initiative, um, a cooking bus which uh, visited uh, schools to deliver uh, cooking sessions, and also evaluating the um, healthy school scheme. So I'm going to be thinking, I guess, a bit about um, food from the perspective of health uh, and specifically um, health improvement. Um, and about how interventions that we might develop, so um, in health improvement interventions, achieve their effects and how key processes might vary uh, across space and also importantly across different groups. And my own particular area of interest is really around uh, family-based approaches and school-based approaches to health promotion. So when, when I sat down to, to look at this talk, I, um, I reached the Oxford English Dictionary to find out what sustainability meant. And one of the definitions that I found for sustainability was um, being able to be maintained at a certain rate or level. And, and that seemed to have some meaning for my work. And I guess the, the work that I'm involved in is maybe thinking about sustainability in, in two ways. The first of those might be around the sustainability of, of behaviour change. So um, we're trying, to, in our work, to promote uh, healthy eating practices um, in childhood and in ways that will track through into adulthood. But we don't really know um, everything about how childhood behaviours track into adulthood and which interventions that are delivered in childhood might promote healthy um, dietary practices in, in the longer term. And then what are the most important processes to target? Should we be targeting uh, knowledge or skills around, say, cooking the children? Or is it more important to look at family routines, norms, culture, or as we've already discussed, availability and, and price <coughs> of different kinds of food? And then thinking about family, family relationships and parenting, how do they shape what children eat now and in the future? And what are more, the more important aspects of family life? Is it targeted parenting around kind of food um, and provision and cooking? Or are more general forms of family relationships important as well? And how do all those things interact with schools and other networks? <coughs> and then the second um, way that I guess I've been thinking about sustainability is the sustainability of interventions themselves. So we may know that a particular intervention has efficacy, it can work. But then I guess the question is, are those interventions going to be effective when they're delivered in real world settings? Are they going to be able to secure long term support, both financial resources, but also commitment? Which organisations um, aims do they serve and which organisations will drive them forward? And a few years ago we did some uh, work on um, a cooking bus that uh, visited schools in Wales to deliver cooking sessions. And we were dealing with, I guess, some of these um, issues. Um, lots of cooking takes place in school, but the evidence base for school-based cooking interventions uh, is limited, both in terms of the outcomes, but also how cooking might promote a healthy diet. But we know there are lots of barriers to doing um, cooking uh, in school around a teacher's time, skills, confidence and facilities. And external interventions, external agencies coming into schools are one way of addressing that. And um, in the work that we did on the, on the cooking and bus in Wales, we drew um, on a um, concept called the social technical network. And, and some of what we, we, we drew on there seems relevant to today. So I'm drawing here on some work by, uh, by Bissett and colleagues, and also by Hoare and Scheel. And they suggest that in health promotion, what we really want to do is to achieve population level change. But the, one of the key problems is that often we are focused on individual level prevention, on, on sending out health messages. And what we actually need to do is to think about schools, families and communities as complex systems. And our aim really should be to try and change the dynamics of the system rather than the, uh, to focus at the level of the individual behaviour. So what might the implications of that be for the health promotion interventions we develop? I guess firstly that context matters, that interventions interact with the settings to, into which they're introduced, and that interventions are not simply sets of ready formed <coughs> messages that need to be diffused through space to change behaviour, but they're actually sets of social processes that are formed through their interaction with particular contexts. So implementation processes really matter, they're part of how interventions take shape, and participants, so schools, pupils, families, are not passive recipients, they actively shape interventions. But what we've tended to do is to think about, I guess, the properties of interventions more than the properties of the actual settings into which they've been introduced. So I'll come back to sustainability. So the, the, the idea of a socio-technical network, that this, this concept that we've used, 
um, talks quite a lot about the factors that might affect whether an intervention to promote healthy eating, for instance, whether those kind of interventions are sustained. And it suggests that what is very important is whether an intervention makes connections with the people um, and their interests in the settings that they're delivered. So do interventions have meanings and relevance in schools and, and communities? And often we're trying to deliver these kind of interventions to promote health in settings that are not really primarily concerned with health, so schools and workplaces, for instance. And what, what Bissett and, and colleagues suggest um, is that where interventions align their interests with those of local actors, with, with the, the goals and interests of, of local uh, participants, they're more likely to be integrated and become part of the routine of everyday life. And that's really one of the key things to their sustainability. When, for instance, parents and teachers start to take on the aims of an intervention and start promoting um, healthy eating in particular ways. So in our study of the, of the cooking bus, what we found was that the, the bus achieved quite a high degree of alignment between its goals as an intervention and the goals of the schools that it was delivered in. It addressed practical problems that schools themselves were trying to address, like how to teach cooking in the curriculum. And it strengthened some of the connections between pupils uh, and teachers and food. So yes, teaching the children how to cook was important, but what was also important was um, some of the more kind of, I guess, school level processes through which cooking might become embedded in the life of schools. So the cooking bus provided cooking equipment for teachers. It helped them to look at how they might actually um, develop their confidence and their skills to sustain cooking in the school after the cooking bus had left. So one of the things that I guess that research taught me was that the connections that people forge with food might not have that much to do with diet or obesity or environmental issues. They could be just as much about interpersonal relationships, so children pleasing their parents, family routines, um, and that those things might be as important as knowledge and skills. So just to sum up then, I guess that left me with I guess a couple of questions. Firstly, what does food, sustainable, food sustainability mean for, for different people in different contexts? And how can we forge the connections between them and, and the whole series of issues around food sustainability? And then, I guess to give you my two items on the menu, um, the first I think is systems thinking. That thinking about these issues around complex and dynamic systems is important. And, th and this sounds a bit, a bit strange, but the other thing I'd like to put on the menu is families. So family relationships and parenting is what I mean by that. Okay, so um, we were supposed to have a son hold here. Has he arrived now from the Federation of City Farms, which is a shame because now the panel is a bit too lenient towards the academic side of things. But thankfully we have uh, Katie and I'm sure there are people in the audience from a variety of backgrounds and perspectives. So um, we've heard, I guess, from these introductory uh, presentations Lots of emphasis on connections, systems, relationships, participation. These are really the key words that I got out of these introductory remarks. Um, I, we have uh, plenty of time now, uh, nearly an hour, for a debate with the <coughs> audience. So let me uh, start by asking you if uh, you have other ideas for what should be on our menu for the future, or if you want to comment on anything you've heard so far. Well, it reminds us of how very complicated this <coughs> question is. So I want to try to raise a couple of very simple questions. Um, one is, I don't think I've heard that anyone has actually asked the kind of people that we think most need to change their behaviour, what would, uh, what their interests are. I mean, I, I just think it would be really beneficial to go and talk to some people who are living on low incomes, who are probably eating not very healthy food, and ask them, why do you eat what you eat? Without any kind of judgment, you know, why do you choose? Is it because of the cost? Is it because you like it? I mean, I have a feeling that Food for most people is a bit like television. You, know, you think you, you need it. Uh, people think they need television as well. You need it, and it comes to you in various forms, and you take what you like. I think for most people, the whole idea of reflecting on whether it's sustainable or not, or how healthy it is, is not a priority. So I, I would just love to have the whole kind of debate informed more by the kind of people that I suspect we think are the ones who need to quote unquote change. 
Because like with culture, you know, you have a sort of fairly, so you have a, a relatively small number of people who uh, uh, consume quality products, and then you have a relatively large number of people who we might say, well, it would, like the BBC used to in the old days, it would be better if they actually consumed something that was better for them. So I, I would just like to, I'd, I'd love to hear more sort of conversations, I'd love to hear more people on panels able to say, look, I've been trying to raise a family on welfare, and this is why I give my kids McDonald's. Um, you know, because th these are the most difficult, there's a huge gap, I think, between the people who are thinking and reflecting and researching and the people that they're actually thinking about. Mm -hmm. okay. So that, that's just one. And then one other quick one is that shoulds, very few of us are motivated by shoulds. We're mostly motivated by wants. And <coughs> I've heard the word should quite a lot from people, that what we should do. And it, actually, that's not really what motivates hardly any of us, I don't think. We, we do what we want to do. And then I think the question is, well, why do people want to eat junk food? You know, I mean, th there's nothing, we can't intrinsically say that there's anything sort of um, morally questionable about that. It's just, if we're talking about behavior change, um, how do we get people to want something different? And I think it's got to be about making the right thing fun and enjoyable and part of culture, uh, rather than that it's healthier and good for them and what they ought to do. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, yeah, uh, Steve was the, um, uh, he established the farmer's market in Cardiff. He's quite well known on the Cardiff food scene. Uh, so, sorry I didn't ask you, but it would be very beneficial for the debate if you could briefly say uh, where you come from. Yes, please. Uh, Kate Jones, I'm uh, senior um, I thought that was really interesting, but I think you can't uh, talk about um, people, what they want or what they're able to access unless you start talking about big food as well. So, you know, the power of big food to create the wants for junk food is something that, you know, governments just refuse to, you know, engage with because, you know, it's just so difficult and because they think, you know, that the industry is so powerful. But we have to take into account the health costs as well and balance that against uh, these powerful food lobbies. Okay, uh, does anyone want to comment on uh, any of these points? <coughs> Talking to low income uh, people rather than about them and this issue of the power of industry and what motivates, uh, what are the factors that really drive our diet? Uh, Janet, please. Yeah, that was a great point. So I, I suppose um, a couple of thoughts on, on, the, on the first sort of issue. I, I guess it, it, it's a complicated issue and it's also a multi level issue. So I suppose we have to look at not only what motivates individuals, but how individuals are part of broader networks and systems. Um, and I guess I'm always struck by the fact that I have a lot of knowledge about what's healthy, and, and yet I continue to maybe eat in ways that I, I maybe shouldn't and do things that I shouldn't. So it, it's much more complex than just giving people information. Um, I suppose in, in what I said in my own uh, presentation, I, I rushed through the, the social technical, technical network, but I suppose one of the key messages from that that I've taken is that we often, successful interventions need to think about the goals and interests of those they're trying to work with. Um, and we did some research, this was on alcohol, this is a school-based intervention where um, parents were invited into school, and the intervention had very high rates of parental engagement. And we did some work to look at why um, the intervention had such high rates of, of involvement. And it wasn't about alcohol, it wasn't about um, health, it was about parents supporting their children and children wanting their parents to, to be in school. So I think it's a really important point you make there that we need to understand, I guess, what, what has meaning for people and what has relevance for them. I, I suppose the other danger is with some of the interventions we have is that they can actually increase health inequalities um, because we don't reach. Um, or we have an even reach across different different groups. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I I agree entirely with Steve that um, assumptions can be a dangerous thing, and I don't think we do ask enough questions. Having said that, I think there is a lot of work that's going on in the community with the types of um, uh, uh, individuals that we're talking about, and we are asking questions. Maybe not directly, but through the work we're doing. So, you know, an example would be the, um, the Nutrition Skills for Life programme with the community dietitians in Cardiff and how they work with the community first areas. Um, there's some, um, I can give you an example of um, 
of where uh, somebody was um, going to a cooking on a budget um, course. Um, and the lady came in a little bit intimidated, a little bit, you know, not unsure of why she was there. She came in, she never even cooked fresh potatoes before. She only ever used tin potatoes. And she left that programme having learnt how to cook fish cakes and then having learnt how to, to actually cook those with her child at home. So there's a lot of work going on at community level and we could probably tap into a lot of information that's there and maybe we're not using that information well enough or maybe we're not asking the right questions. Um, so that, that was one point. The other point is this, this, this point around enforcing our views on other people and you know how you're going to generate behaviour change is through assisting people to make their own choices um, and it's not going to happen by enforcing people to make certain choices. So I think a lot more work around how, how we frame um, how we frame some of the, the work that we do and a lot of that is by involving um, people from the early stages of the work that we do in the community. Yeah, um, yeah I, I completely agree with you Steve as well about um, yeah, how we engage with the people that maybe are low incomes and are not having um, are not consuming kind of like what we call a healthy diet. Uh, and what is the idea of like what type of diet they want to consume and why they do it. I think uh, there's been quite a lot of um, information coming out about how people with low incomes are experiencing poverty and I think that's uh, quite telling. But I do feel that in many, like in a space like this one, these people are not included and, don't, are, and will never come in some ways. So I think we do need to rethink what type of spaces we are creating and what type of tools we are giving for people to participate, not only to be able to take up programs but also that their voice is actually heard in some ways, um, not only heard, but we can hear it directly in some ways, no? making that. And, and I think that's a challenge for many programs uh, um, which are doing great things in terms of increasing their participation in cities like food policy councils and so on. But that level of yeah, being more inclusive and actually taking into account all those views and opinions and, and experiences and ideas and, and, and meanings, it is uh, uh, very, very important. And, um, just maybe to, to pick up on the on the uh, on the element of, of big food um, and from the research uh, side of, of the equation, it is very difficult to uh, research big food, uh, big agri food, and how to um, get inside what is happening in, in, in all these companies and all the processes that are going on uh, there. And uh, and I think that's uh, that's kind of like also a sign of the privatization of the whole uh, food system and how we're losing spaces such as the wholesale market or maybe other spaces that could be more open uh, and they have been uh, privatized. And, and I think it's something that we have to ask for ourselves, how we include, if we want to, these people in the conversation or at least being able to access and to research what is going on and what the impact is. Um. Comments or questions on the, yes, please. Just to sort of comment on, on the food supply. Like, sorry, I'm Hilary Rogers from the School of Biosciences, so I'm a, I'm a plant scientist, but I'm interested in uh, post harvest waste and <laughs> um, post harvest nutrition and so on. And so I'm trying to enter into a dialogue with the food supply chain, particularly on fresh fruit and vegetables. And I think there is a willingness there, after all, they want to sell their product. So I think engaging in that conversation with them about what the drivers are is not going to come completely on deaf ears. Um, I particularly talk to uh, sort of salad processors. They're selling salads which are healthy products <laughs> yeah. and they're keen to sell more of them, obviously. And they feel that it is a growing market and that there is sort of space for that and there should be. Mm. So I think you know, yeah, it's something that needs course. to be done and can be done, I mm. think. I think that there are, of course, parts of the of the of the food industry, but I, I think that's a, that's a part of the conversation which is difficult. When we talk, for instance, around sugar tax, or we talk about processed food, which com uh, those conversations are more difficult. I'm not saying that that they are impossible, but but it is uh, difficult to tap on those, and, and probably will be also useful to create those spaces to be able to have those conversations with different stakeholders, including public institutions, and so on. And the other thing is that big food will produce the products that sell. And I think public procurements have a big part to play in this, in that if we're you know, demanding that we want healthy products in our vending machines across all our hospitals in Wales, and that we want healthy products in all our vending machines in all the leisure centres in Wales, and that we're 
offering only healthy food in any retail outlet, in any um, public sector building, any public sector funded building in the city, you're going to start, especially in a place like Wales where the public sector is a big, big employer, you're going to start to, to shift um, the products which sell and big food are going to have to sit up and listen. So I think the public procurement side is, is really, really important in starting this, this shift. Yeah, just a comment really. Um, Brazil have just um, made a, um, an announcement about uh, public policy, um, which Michael Pollan did. You see, did you see it? Michael Pollan tweeted it this week. And I mean, what was really interesting about that was that they see, they they had to battle a bit with uh, big food, but somehow they managed to get it through. Um, and and their main message was stop eating processed foods. You know, eat real food, mm -hmm. uh, eat with other people. Really, kind of holistic. Uh, way of uh, looking at things. But in a sense, uh, if I can jump in on the Brazilian example to create a connection with what you just said, I've done some work in Brazil. I've written, recently written an article on exactly the story you're telling. And what I think is key in Brazil, which is probably something for us to think about for this debate as well, what's been key to the success of the government and the new legislation is the involvement of civil society. A massive, massive drive coming from the bottom up, from civil society organizations, which is in a sense what Katie was talking about when she mentioned if we demanded certain types of food in public spaces, mm -hmm. perhaps we could create the basis for something different. So any thoughts on that? Issues of power, do we have power as civil society or yes? I think you can see the example of how McDonald's now sells salad and low-fat yogurt and stuff like that. So there is a buzz for a healthier lifestyle. So these big food corporations are starting to shift a little. But I think it's not all that, like what uh, Katie said, big food will produce uh, the products that sell, but they can also sell the products they produce. Like Coca-Cola will brainwash you to by the Coca-Cola, if they were producing healthier stuff or regulation made them produce healthier stuff, they'll sell it. They'll find a way to sell it. So I think it's, it goes both ways. Regulation can make them sell the products, healthier products, and we can also push them from bottom up to uh, sell healthier products and sustainable, more sustainable products. So it's like a combination of both. No, it, it can't be only one way or, or the other. It's also interesting to see how um, the supermarkets are now beginning to, you know, to struggle. You know, um, and people are, you know, there's evidence to show that, that people are actually wanting something different. They're bored of going to the same old supermarket, getting, you know, the whole great big array of product. They want a different offer, you know, and people are seeking a bit of um, a bit of innovation, something slightly different. And I think I think there is opportunities for smaller businesses to really sort of push through on that agenda. Uh, Steve, and then, yeah. Well, um, <coughs> yes, civil society <coughs> is really important, but I, I do not understand why our governments on a local or even a national level, but say on a local level, who are there to protect our interests, simply don't ensure that what Katie described, you know, really, we they should not be promoting junk food in the kind of... Uh, health centers that they run, the events that they run. Uh, to me, it's, I just don't understand what's the big deal. I know there's economics involved, but please, guys, let's have, we know that there is an obesity epidemic, we know that the cost of dealing with the health issues of kids eating junk food is about to go through the roof. You know, the very fact that Coke and McDonald were the major sponsors of the Olympics tells us that our food system is insane. And, you know, I think the top-down part is that you know, we, I expect our local council in the health centre to at least have a healthy option. Then the other part, the, the bottom up, is coming from yeah, the kind of things, Katie, you mentioned, you know, the, the grassroots initiatives where people are realising, my God, it's actually, the potatoes I cook taste a hell of a lot better and my kids even like them more than the stuff out of the tin. So they're not, I don't think she's doing it because she thinks she should. She's doing it, you know, cooking the potatoes because it's cheaper and better. And um, I, I just finished by saying, 
it's fascinating in a place like Detroit, for example, where now urban agriculture is becoming a new major employer because in the sites where the old automobile factories were knocked down, people with no work are realizing, listen, we're spending the money at McDonald's, let's grow our own food and, and, and let's keep the money within the, within the community. It's kind of an exciting thing. It's a buzz. It's a feeling of empowerment. It's a thing that most human beings feel good about. And I think we just need to have the guts. I think in Wales sometimes we won't be timid, you know, about confronting the, 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 the norms. Let's, let's get some food growing projects in the valleys on the sites of the old coal mines. Let's get new industries going um, so that we can all start to feel, yeah, we don't have to do what Tesco's and McDonald's tell us. We can actually do what we think is good for us, you know. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I chip in with a couple of good news stories? Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> I was already getting depressed. Please. Well, no, just to talk about, you know, things are happening in the public sector, and especially in Cardiff. So all of the, all of the school catering that happens now in Cardiff, all the fish served is from sustainable sources, so there's been a pledge for that. All of the hospitals in Cardiff um, have pledged to serve sustainable fish. Uh, Cardiff University here is a bronze food for life um, Sword Association caterer. They've also pledged to serve any sustainable fish. Cardiff and Vale Health Board are in the um, process now of um, agreeing two different um, criteria, one, about, one around retail, one about restaurant food standards, looking at how 75% of the choices in those environments are going to be the healthy choice. Um, and these are big things which um, certainly in terms of the work that's happening now with the health board, a lot of loops to go through, a lot of negotiations and all sorts of implications. Um, and you know, you can see that um, people coming in to look at tender for a process where you're saying, well, we want 75% of your food to be healthy, and they're saying, well, we haven't had to deal with this before. So, but it's the start of a journey because I hope that if I'm doing my job right, certainly in Cardiff, you know, we will have more and more public sector demanding that. Those, those criteria, and hopefully that local level will then spread to a national level. And we're having evidence of that kind of thing happening already um, in the economy of Wales. So there is some good news stuff. Can I just add to that? Is that right? Just please. please. Um, uh, my name is Jess. I'm the procurement dietitian for NHS Wales, so obviously I work um, a lot with Katie. And I guess it's just trying to think about what else could we be doing because when we write our tender specification, you know, with sort of um, the input from Katie, we've been saying, you know, we want this sort of um, quality to the meat, or we want it to be sourced in this way. But with EU regulations, it is quite difficult in terms of sort of local sourcing and things. But it'd be good to know with sort of the experts around the table, what else could we be adding to the procurement sort of specification? So for the products we do tender, are kind of as sustainable as they can be. Well, after a decade of research on public procurement, I have to answer this question. <laughs> How about using PDO, PGI certifications, which well, could bring Welsh meat into the menu, for example? Because I can safely say that there's nothing in the EU legislation per se. Local food cannot be specified as such. Mm -hmm. You cannot use the word local, but if you describe a product that it's only grown in your area, or if you use the PDO, PGI certification, which is perfectly legal, you may create an important market for Welsh producers, meat producers in particular. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, so, so we're already there, I think, with that for, for Welsh beef and for, um, not for Welsh lamb, but because of the price increase. So it would be so much more, it would cost us so much more to serve um, Welsh lamb. But I think there, there's probably two different arguments to that. I mean, I've spoken to solicitors who wouldn't stand up in court and say, yes, that the PGI status isn't the same as asking for local sourcing. They would say it means the same thing. It doesn't. I can solve it yeah. the yeah. I'd be happy to, but I can promise you it doesn't. What about other products you know, outside of PGI status? Because obviously that's only sort of such a small... Yeah, um, we've had a discussion around eggs, haven't we, and looking at using free-range eggs, for example, over um, regular eggs and what the cost implication is of that. And I think constantly, you know, you've got to look at balancing cost, haven't you, against, um, against the benefit. Um, um, you can use organic. Uh, you can use fairly traded as an expression in the specification to bring in some fair trade products, because obviously the menu should 
include, I think, a sensitivity to the future of people from other countries as well, so particularly developing countries, in my view. So big market for fair trade as well, the public sector. I think you had a question a, a while ago, and then we'll introduce our fourth panel member, who's finally joined us. <laughs> Hi there, um, thanks very much everyone. Um, my name is Julian Balance, I'm a uh, full-time student of science communication. Um, this is quite a broad question, so apologies if you, if you can't answer this, but it just uh, sprung to mind as you were each talking. Is how do we um, find the balance between healthy people and a healthy earth? So, there's, and is there a danger of mixed messages by, on one hand you can tell people this is how to be better, da 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 da, and then on the other hand, you're going to say, well, actually, we've just realised that you know, the meat that you, we're telling you to eat is not ethically sourced, or it, you know, there's a lot of CO2 involved in the production. And how um, how you see us moving forward and finding that balance between you know, growing healthy as, as individuals, but also sustaining a, a healthy planet? Um, and I think probably the two are intertwined, but it'd be interesting to think. Good question. Uh, Sam, so maybe you want to try to answer. <laughs> 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 That's not fair. That's That's a great question. Introduce yourself. <laughs> and answer the question. Introduce yourself. <laughs> um, first question. Introduce who I am. Uh, <coughs> I used to be in uh, Western Avenue closure was uh, exactly the wrong way. So I was, uh, um, my name is Sam Holt. I work for the Federation of City Farms and Community Gardens. I run my own business called Exceed, which is focused on outdoor education. Um, and I also support farming countryside education, so trying to act, get uh, schools and people to access um, outdoor education, farms, and understand where food comes from and connects in. Uh, do we have a summary of the question? <laughs> <laughs> Could you uh, reflect again on what you were asking? Yeah, so, sure. And um, it's, a, it's the, some of the different areas that people are talking about in terms of priorities, in terms of well, on one side you've got um, how do we improve the health of the society, of individuals, and on the other side, it's well, we're also trying to improve the health of the planet in terms of um, driving down um, CO2 emissions and finding that balance between promoting a healthy society and a healthy planet. And is there a danger of mixed messages? And when you're telling people on one hand, this is how you should eat well, um, and then, ah, no, you can't eat that because that's sourced from the other side of the world. Because um, even, I'll, you know, I'll happily admit that there are times when I eat stuff recently and I'm only just discovering that it's not sourced or ethically sourced. And um, it's how, how you find that balance between you know, healthy, healthy people and a healthy planet. Okay. So for me that, that kind of comes back to a, a core issue I think there is, is the valuing of food. And um, at the moment, the, the value of food is not bringing the conversation of, about food in everybody's sort of domain. People aren't discussing where their food comes from en enough yet um, until people start valuing the food as much as they do their mobile phones and their internet connection and, and the their size of their TV, we're going to have an issue. Um, once people start valuing it, I believe the conversation starts more and start, people start uh, putting pressure on, on people to to look at the systems that are in place and how better they can um, bring about a, sort of a better food procurement, uh, better sourcing. Um, we certainly can be doing a lot more. People might be thinking about how they can, can grow more, how more, how more they can produce their own animals more locally. Uh, there's certainly a lot of wasted space uh, and, and better ways and more efficient ways of using it. Um, but it really comes around that conversation and where the pressure comes from. And I think until people start valuing again, as I say, um, food uh, as, a, as a, a life need for everybody, um, we're not really going to um, answer all of that. We need the pressure to build and people to start putting that on, on the providers of the food and say, we want better sourced food. We understand the health messages um, and we want to know where, where we can get it from. Um, so that, that's really it, is the value for me. Um, comments or questions on... Yes. Can I comment? Uh, particularly on, on that note, I think, I mean, there, there are so many cases and so many implications of our diets in, in the planet, but 
Um, I think uh, quite an interesting example is the example about oily fish and, and uh, what are the recommendations in terms of health and how they are uh, they are affecting fish stocks and that's kind of like uh, there's quite a contradiction there but if you sustain picked up this contradiction and want to kind of like look at what type of fish we could be eating and and they develop a whole research around the and a list of sustainable fish that it was good for our health and it was not kind of like affecting the fish stock so I think there are ways around it the things that we need to have those conversations and and sit around those contradictions to see how we can overcome them there are so many. I, I, I mean, it's a bit, uh, yeah, it, it, is, it, it is a bit too much in some senses. But, but I think this is a nice example to see that we can drive things forward despite that we have these trade-offs and we can, yeah, build around them. Yeah. The funny enough is Conor Rule that prompted the question, I think, because I used to take Conor Rule tablets and very recently, mm -hmm. and then reading a lot more about how they, where the omega-3, the fish oil has actually come mm -hmm. from, how they're sourced from the shrimps, etc., made me question, mm -hmm. and that's only through education. On my part, I'm like, ah, I've got to put my hands up and, and say, hey, I, 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 was, I shouldn't be doing that. But that was only through education. Um, yeah, no, I think it is a really complicated picture. And I think the, um, the Brazil um, uh, example of looking at, you know, using, um, using food, looking at processed food versus non processed food, cooking from scratch, you know, eating and company, I think all of those things are really, really important and they're simple messages. It's a really complicated picture. And if you know you and I are having this discussion um, about how to understand it, then you know Joe Bloggs on the streets going to get really confused. So it, you know it's it's um, it's a challenge that is really challenging. But um, it is becoming recognised um, slowly that health and sustainability are linked, and that by following a sustainable diet, a diet which respects the planet, will offer health benefits and vice versa. And um, the US dietary guidelines, um, which are just being presented now, are, are a bit of a reflection of that. And it will be interesting to see what the fallout of it is of the dairy industry and the meat industry. And, um, and all the rest of And Jeremy. Yeah. I, I guess just a reflection that there are limitations to, to giving people information, I suppose. And, and what was going through my mind is that actually we can at least try and create some of the conditions to, you know, in which people can make decisions and choices. And it is about diet, but it's also, I guess, about maybe being able to cook food and to grow food um, as well. I suppose the other thing I was thinking was that in the field of health promotion, we are often trying to bring together health and education and different kind of, maybe not different, not competing goals, but maybe different goals. And there are ways, I think, as, as Katie said, of, of trying to find where there's synergy and maybe that's what we can focus on. Yes, please. Uh, Richard Berry, Riverside Market Garden. Um, I'm going to have to leave, so I just want to say something just before I go, really. I think we're being too polite. Uh, I think we've got very clever, articulate um, ideas. Somebody said over there, brainwashing. Steve mentioned about uh, an epidemic of obesity. An epidemic. Brainwashing. You know, th these, this is huge. This is to do with how our society is, is organised and so I went recently um, to a McDonald's, I've never been to a McDonald's before in my life. Um, no, I did take my children when, once when they were younger just into a shop. Uh, I went with some young people and I was driving the car and we got to the window and I didn't know what to do. And they, they said to me, well you move, move down to the next window, all oh, right. And they were amazed I had never been to a McDonald's. These are young people who have grown up with McDonald's being, um, and I've heard parents in the playground say this, if you're good, if you pass your exam, do this and that, you'll be taken to McDonald's. Pride. Where is the pride? We've got a huge, huge issue here when our lives are dominated, when we are brainwashed by these huge corporations and we have an epidemic on our hands, an epidemic of illness. You know, Recently, there was a potential epidemic of Ebola. Ebola has killed a minute number of people. Obesity will kill thousands and thousands and thousands, a huge number of people. And they won't die in a nice way. They'll die through illness, through fatigue, through pain, and mis being miserable. I've seen it. I've got a member of my family who's obese. Mm -hmm. and it's not pleasant to see them just fading away. So, you know, I just think it's a very serious issue. We need to be... Uh, need to be speaking up in a much stronger way. 
Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for thank you for raising the issue. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Alan Kane from the law school. Um, I wanted to ask to what extent this debate is actually a result of um, people not really understanding what a sustainable sex group actually looks like, um, whether meat is um, sustainable, you know, or unsustainable per se, whether organic is just a brand, and the same as fair trade, how efficient these, um, these labels are, um, and who is out there to educate them on what, what might be sustainable. Where's the debate to be had? Um, those are my kind of, uh, questions. Yeah. I, I think sustainable is an incredibly loaded word, and I don't think it's actually very helpful um, in, in discussing this debate at all. And it, for me, it, it comes back to how do we change the culture from big food, processed food, to cooking and eating together from, um, from um, fruit and veg from scratch in the home. And that's kind of, you know, for me, where the issue, um, where the issue lies. Um, um, can you introduce yourself? My name's Alistair, I'm a, uh, a student at Cardiff University. Um, with reference to how supermarkets are struggling and also adapting, at the moment we're seeing a lot of um, superstores closing down, a lot of smaller, uh, more local uh, services popping up, you know, Tesla Express, everywhere. And I was, I was wondering, like, what are the drivers of this, you know, and kind of what are the kind of cultural shifts that are actually happening at the moment in terms of our shopping habits? And being about kind of last minute lifestyles, you know, you don't know what you're going to cook until you get home, you go, well, I want to eat, and you pop out the Tesco Express, you buy your ingredients, and, and, I, and I was wondering if there's, there's um, kind of any discussion about these more underlying processes of cultural change and, and how these are going to be shaping people's attitudes to food and how we can maybe tap into that, where is a, like, you know, a bad thing per se. Well, I think something we need to be aware of, you know, you know kind of individualistic, yeah, last minute of culture. Yeah, Sam. I was just, one thing to add on that is that there is a, an opportunity in that last minute culture. Um, one thing we've seen uh, sort of the rise in popularity is in the street food industry. And obviously mm. that is a last minute, it's already cooked, you go out, it's there ready for you. Um, and it's a great way of getting the conversation going. Um, there's a, it's a great um, sort of hub of, of you know, community coming together and eating. And I think around the world you'll see that the cultures do go out and eat on the streets, they do meet people there, they have lots of different vendors. And we're just starting to see an emergence of this sort of industry here. And in that way, the convenience food of, of street food is probably a great way to, to take that conversation and use that fact that people are looking for that last minute, sort of what do I do tonight? Kind of thing. Um, Helen Obi Reardon from First Campus. Um, it's not so much a question as a, re as a reflection, really. A lot of what I'm, I'm hearing about tonight it seems to revolve around the language that we use. Um, we hear the language of the advertisers, you know, the word brainwashing has been used enough, uh, a lot. Um, we're also getting the language of the media as well. There's a lot of mixed messages coming through. Who is the bad guy? Is it fat? Is it sugar? What's going on? It's no wonder that the communities that we're, we're talking about, you know, I'm confused. No wonder they are. Um, also the language of procurement. I'm not having a go NHS lady. <laughs> but in a project that I used to work on, we did so much work on procurement in a, in a different sector. And it is tough. But I heard the really crucial word there, which was but. And it's like, can we, can we start breaking the buts, please? Um, and I think you may have, Dr. Rob may have some of the, the answers, which is great. But the most critical thing, I think, is the language that we use with the communities that we think need to he hear the message. And the thing that I've learned year on year is the first thing you do is you go in and you listen. You listen to them. And you, you start to understand their challenges and the language that they speak, not the language that we speak. And you put it in those terms to them. So I think we've got to be really careful because it, we run the risk of this sounding like the holier than thou deficit model. And that's never going to get a message across. That's never going to make change. Very interesting point, actually. Please, yes. Um, on the topic of language and kind of on, on labels, I think one of the biggest frustrations I come up against is the way that um, sustainable, local, 
um, the different food labeling systems that we do have in place, for instance, red tracks or organic, um, food and food, higher welfare, outdoor born, outdoor reared, all of those I think make things really, really difficult for even people who are already engaged in the conversation to make a decision that is informed and leads them down the track that they're trying to go down. Um, and I think there's a, a legislation issue in terms of what people should be allowed to say so that at least the people who are already on board with trying to make these decisions are able to make them without falling at the first hurdle mm -hmm. and then feeling disillusioned because they tried and they failed, so what's the point? And you almost lose people then through the, through the fact that they failed when they were trying to do something right. Um, yeah, uh, we teach a module in CIPAN, actually a module leader for something called sustainable food systems. I have my students here, so they know week in and week out, we go through the complications of this notion of sustainability. And probably one important way of looking at this is realizing, as I say in class all the time, that we are dealing with a journey, not with a destination. Uh, it's about the process, it's about the normative standard that, that the notion of sustainability gives us and then you have to make negotiations and trade-offs on the ground, uh, what Katie was saying uh, before. So there's no, there's, in my view, there is no type of label or certification that alone is going to tell you this is going to be a sustainable food, it's a combination and it's very context dependent, it depends on many, many different local factors. So, but it's a very interesting conversation to have, I feel. Um, yes, please. I'm Helen Nichols, a community dietitian in Cardiff and Vale. Um, just a couple of points. I totally agree there's a lot of mixed messages in the media at the moment, which I think just confuses people. And we need to keep it simple. People don't eat fat or sugar, they eat food. And we need to keep those messages around food very simple. Um, I think also around the community food initiatives and changing behaviour, the evidence is very limited about what works and we do need to listen more to communities and then perhaps be bold and try some things out and gain that evidence base for ourselves. But the one area that keeps coming back is around cooking skills and people need those cooking skills and we've heard about the positive influence of the cooking bus. Um, yet that service is now being disinvested in. So I think we need to, where there is the evidence base that something works, we need to then take that forward for Wales. Very interesting. Hi, I'm Gillian Bell. Yes, I'm a former food retailer. I'd like to pick up on what you said about education. There's a lot coming through what you said in education. So how do we as society try and get food and cooking onto our national curriculum without the kids learning about it every day, where the food group comes from, how it's grown, how it's produced, and getting involved in community gardens and things, and so get that ground stuff happening. How can we, how can we do that? It's pretty bizarre. I never thought I'd be mentioning it here, but an idea was shared with me a few years ago. Um, some people in the room know Andy Middleton from TYF quite a bit, so they had lots of different visionary sort of ideas. But something that gelled there, a simple idea which could be expanded across all schools, was the 10 jars concept. Um, I don't know who came up with it, but he was the one who shared it with me. And it was simply, if we can get the children in primary and secondary, before they leave their secondary school, to know how to grow and fill 10 jars of produce, to know how to process them, to know how to store them, to know how to then market it, to understand the business of it, then we will be sending them off into the world with more tools than, than just having an A-level or a GCSE will give. Um, and it was such a simple concept of what you had to do, I can't understand why it's not embedded in the curriculum. And I'm always trying to look for ways of increasing um, the kind of work I do and understanding outdoor education and how that could be used into the curriculum as well. Um, but maybe through the Welsh back, um, looking at what the WJC can do, um, if we can get more programmes into there to be accepted, that may be a, a, an option. But you are right to, to bring it up. Education is needing to change and put food and uh, sort of food and um, the food business in, into its sort of educational structure because it's it's a fast growing business it's a it's a hugely important one to the UK uh, and we need to put more focus on it to make sure people realize the avenues in which they can access that economy and and look into the career path as well there are so many different avenues into the, the food business uh, not just on on the grounds um, 
and, and we don't really share those with the children. It's only when you hit university and start doing your degrees you suddenly realise all these different jobs are available to you. We need to make sure uh, national schemes face um, who I, I do freelance work for have got, um, well I'm going to go blank on this now, they, they've got a new programme launched, and I can't remember the name of it right this second, but it's all about looking at the career paths and showing people how they can map out and how they can do different subjects and how they fit in. Um, and it's, it's a really good opportunity, and uh, been recently talking with Lantra, Lan, you know, who uh, do, deal with a lot of land-based um, education about how we can all work together to make sure more knowledge about the, the career paths and um, how your education will fit into that um, to try and encourage more people into the food and agricultural um, sort of the business stream. Uh, Jeremy, yeah, I know Jeremy and Kate both want to comment, and then we have quite a few questions from the audience. So if you can be as quick as possible, please. Okay. Um, yeah, I think. Um, Curriculum is important. I suppose what I'd also say there is I think it needs to be a whole school approach. So the curriculum needs to tie into the food that's provided in the canteen, but then also into the broader physical and social environment at school. Um, and I guess there are some pretty big gaps around the research around kind of um, cooking based interventions in childhood. So I guess one question is does teaching children to cook at age 11 is that something that will then stay with them into adulthood? Um, compared with, say, kind of looking more at family routines and practices, and I think there's there's some pretty major gaps there. I suppose just come back to the issue about the obesity epidemic. Epidemic, um, I think prevention is is key. It's hard, it's challenging, but but we have to get to grips with prevention and, and trying to promote uh, healthy norms and healthy diets from from a young age. Um, uh, yeah, no, I've just just to say that this is right. That Berman talked agenda was in a public health meeting this morning, and we were had this very discussion um, around what we should be doing in the schools. Um, for anyone that's interested in this area, I would suggest looking at the Food for Life um, scheme in um, uh, the Sword Association runs mainly in England and that takes that whole school approach. And I've heard a case study recently of how not only does it educate the kids around food, but actually it can turn the school around as well. Um, so that's something that's, um, that's worth looking at. <coughs> Yeah, uh, I believe that I'm a student of the School of Plan Job in college thinking and I'm also taking a model that I think just mentioned. Basically it's about like who defines what healthy food is. Like for instance, it's all well and good that yes, say society is coming forward and then you have community gardens and they're, they're coming out with ways of actually producing food and vegetables and fruits from scratch. But then again, uh, defining what healthy food is is very contentious. If you had sort of organizations such as United Nations and FAO, come out with the system called, called Codex Alimentarius, which basically imposes a lot of stringent checks before something which is food related, such as food supplements, can actually be put out in the market, then small producers are going to have a very hard time. And it's only going to be possible for like large multinational corporations to actually come up with those standards, implement those checks. And this is already being uh, it's already a problem in the States where uh, you have people, you have community farms and you have small farmers and livestock rarers which are trying to sell unpasteurized uh, grass-fed cow milk, which is far more superior to pasteurized milk, and they're also trying to sell the meat or pork. But the, the state government actually demonizes and criminalizes those activities, and then brings in, in the National Guard and the FBI and a lot of different these, these sort of um, uh, law enforcement agencies to actually sort of have a crackdown on these, on these communities, on these people, because they're not following sort of the, the guidelines which dictate that Healthy food is actually sort of something that's very sanitary, that's supposed to be produced in these uh, sort of surgical environments such as uh, uh, sort of meat packing plants and, and, and food processing areas. So, you know, the, the larger picture also has to be taken into account uh, before we can actually revel in the fact that yes, we as, as, as grassroots consumers and producers are doing something for the benefit of, of the population and humanity as well. Um, my name is Sean, I'm a student at the school. Uh, I've got a question for Sam. Um, I'm looking at urban regeneration, and I, I've asked people in uh, Adams Valley, so disconnected from you know, the uh, lack of public communities, transport, etc. And I've asked, uh, would you be interested in setting up a community garden, um, participating in cooperatives? And they said, no, what's the point? And there's no pride in place without that sense of, I love my community. How can we implement 
community gardens and how can we set up cooperatives if people want to just get away from the hardships and the lack of resources which are existential to their communities already. So looking at food, not just from a, an amenities point of view, but looking at the holistic approach of can we improve our communities, especially not just urban, and we, we always discuss cities, not just uh, rural communities. So how can we restore pride in place to implement food city uh, gardens cooperatives? Without knowing the specifics, it's very hard to come up with a simple answer for you. But um, to go and visit. Uh, it is definitely uh, if it's in the southeast, I can come and visit. Otherwise, I'll send one of my other workers. But actually, the thing about the community garden, mate, the concept may be missed. Um, it is about growing food. Don't get me wrong on that. But it becomes a hub, a way of connecting people. Food is the thing that connects them, and the community garden kind of gives them. We understand what we're going to be doing when we get there. So it gives them kind of that excuse to break down that barrier of t attending first of all. But once they're there, a community garden is a lot more. And it becomes that place where you build that pride and where you live. You make connections with people you wouldn't make before. Um, and it can be very hard to, to get it across. So it may be the words and the sort of the message um, it's being portrayed as. Yes, you might want them to event eventually grow their own food and do a lot more. But it's more about trying to engage them to, to come together and explain that food can be a fun way to do that. And maybe the first way is to have a, a, a local food event, get, bring, invite people over for dinner at your house, or, or have something like street food, um, or to do something like the big lunch and get the street actually eating together. Um, that's where the conversation starts. And when they realise it's a bit more about coming together, then maybe that, that pride will come as well. I think also going and visiting <coughs> some of the, the places that have successfully you know, regenerated spaces, you know, an example would be the Pan Pan. Um, I think that's really beneficial, that people can actually see what's happening there's also other sorts of projects that people might like to start with. For example, um, Sam starting a hops project. You know, people might might um, <laughs> link with beer <laughs> better than carrots, for example. So as a start, yeah, as a start, as a start. Healthy as a start. start. <laughs> find, yeah, find what hooks them and get them in that way. People like beer. Let's grow hops. We'll get them talking about food. We we'll get them talking about local economy that way. I use any form of food I can. Any interest somebody has to get those conversations started, and you just need to keep re-approaching that. And maybe it's about, I guess, asking them what, what are the issues for you? What, 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 what do you need? What would, you, what would be meaningful and important for you? And maybe there is something there that you could also meet halfway. Yes. Um, I think a lot of the conversation here tonight has been about, we, we're an advanced society. And a lot of the malnutrition today is caused by overnutrition. But if you look on a global level, and I go back to the title of today's talk, the future of our food, what needs to be on the menu, shouldn't we be thinking globally? The Chinese, the Indians, they're wanting to eat more and more animal protein. Globally, we cannot produce the amount of food to feed those animals to produce that protein. Should we not be actually looking for the future of our food. I'm not saying to go vegetarian, but to make people aware that meat is actually a really very valuable source, but it's actually a very expensive way to feed our population and to feed globally. We should be talking about fresh water. We should be talking about animal protein. I mean, yes, we can talk about fat, sugar, or carbohydrate, but we're talking at a very, I don't know, advanced society. We're not thinking about the global situation. And if we don't, in the fairly near future, we're going to have problems because the price of meat is going to be so high, people aren't going to be able to afford it. Yeah, um, um, yeah I think that's a very good point because sometimes we just focus on what we have uh, in front of us. But I think it's important to have a balanced view between the future and where <coughs> we are now and, and those transitions and how we're going to, to get there. Um, there's been, there is quite a lot of talk about what, how we're going to feed the 9 billion in, in, in 2050. And, well, the 9 billion, well, the this, this 6 and a half, 7 billion that are right now here are not fed neither. So I think it's important to have a balance between future and present. And I also think about the, the interconnections with, with, uh, of our diets, of our diets with, with other 
diets. And in that sense, I think it's very interesting to think about how the uh, countries are changing, but, not, but also think about um, that, yeah, we are a developed society, but how um, that has, that's a very complex picture. And I think what we're talking about here today is about that as well, like how there are many different situations, many different people, and in every country is, is, is the same, how it's not just about north and south of developing or developed countries, but how um, low-income people are everywhere and how those, uh, those livelihoods are, are difficult in different places. But it's definitely important to link our future to the rest of the planet in, in not only environmental terms, which is very linked in terms of climate change and so on, but in social and economic terms as well, and in terms of justice that we were um, highlighting in terms of fair trade and, and what does that mean, what our diets mean for others as well. The big thing going around that is the disconnection with our food. Um, very focused on trying to get people to understand where their food comes from and connect them back with the animals and the crops in which they, they need to eat. Um, I'm very, uh, a big advocate for keeping chickens. I like to get schools keeping chickens, I like to get everybody keeping chickens to understand what goes into that because it's only when I started keeping chickens myself over my life that I realised I can't have a chicken every Sunday for dinner because that means I need to have so many chickens to be looked after and where would I get the food for that? How would I afford that? And by actually handling and having access and experience of doing that, I realised I need to cut down the level of meat that I have and I need to make sure my diet reflects that. Um, and I think by giving people that connection back with, with our food, we might be able to instil that in our culture, but hopefully obviously that will be used in other cultures as well. I was, I was just going to talk, um, I won't talk about it, but obviously you know, from a European perspective, if we have no food, policy as such, that's a problem to start with at the even regional and European level rather than the, you know, the global level. Um, and I was going to make another point about the as well. Um, yeah, can't remember. Um, yes. Um, I just want to say thank you. Everyone's made really interesting points. There's been a lot of talk about raising public awareness and education and changing people's perspective, but I suppose that has to build towards a tipping point, and that tipping point, I would hope, uh, would be a shift in policy at a local level and internationally. And I suppose I'd just like to ask what kind of policies you think local authorities and Welsh Government and UK Government could uh, put forward to think of more strategically about food? already mentioned public procurement, but I suppose I'm really interested in kind of land use on a bigger scale than small community gardens. I don't know if anyone's got any points. Any, any thoughts on land use? On, on policy, no. Um, <laughs> but I can reflect on, on process just within Cardiff alone. Large, larger areas of land are being looked at by the council and how they can be used differently. Um, community gardens is just a way uh, of getting people to grow locally, and, and you're right, you, you can't feed the city on that, but you can certainly produce, I found, more food on a community garden than you can on just an allotment, because you share the risk with each other, and you share the responsibilities. But there are also other schemes like CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, um, you've got Riverside uh, Market Garden uh, as a CSA in, in, the, in the room with us, but that's where people sort of share the risks with the farmer and they, they invest money into the land and that they can produce a lot more food for the city. Um, so I think there are models um, to use land differently and I have to say Cardiff Council, Monmouthshire Council are both looking at this and how to encourage more growing, uh, more flagship sites uh, and have certainly started the process. Um, so I'm very proud to be here in Cardiff and helping that. Um, but around policy, sorry. Anna and Katie wanted to jump in, and then there's a question, probably the last two. Yeah, Yeah. Um, well, in relation to policy, I think uh, Katie made the point that there's not a European food policy and there's not a national food policy, and, and there are lots of uh, political silos in that way that many of people, many departments that should be having this conversation are not really connected, so that would be, I think, a first stage. And in terms of, of land use, the access to land is very difficult, just in terms of price, so that's like something related to that and looking at policies or, or planning processes that will uh, free up some land I think is very interesting and I'm not so sure about initiatives here but um, in, in mainland Europe there are initiatives around uh, land banks where people can like, lease land and people that are looking for land and they exchange uh, those land, uh, those uh, 
um, yeah, those properties for some time and they are supported uh, by municipalities or, 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 the, or regional governments and they are uh, been working very well and, and maybe that's a, an option. Yeah, on the, I think there's two aspects. It's not just the land, it's also the skills. So we've got a, a dearth of um, horticultural skills, people who actually want to go into, um, into horticulture, which is what we're looking at here. So there's a land issue, there's a skills issue. Um, we're just about to come into the next phase of the Rural Development Plan, and I know the Welsh Government is having these discussions now about you know, what that's going to look like. So I think... Um, and I'm, I'm at, met with the Deputy Minister um, last month to talk about some of these issues about how we're going to get more food grown, um, more fruit and veg grown in Wales. And yes, you know, there is land, you can see land, you know, you look out in the Vale and there's land, so there's lots of land not doing anything. And I, I, yeah, part of what I want to do is work out how can we get some more fruit and veg and um, horticulture grown on that. But, you know, we need the funding for the skills as well. Yeah, and we need more focus on, on the education again. Uh, the colleges all merge and they, they all suffer a hard time um, and there needs to be more focus on um, making sure that those who can access these colleges uh, are supported and that it's not just focused on the farming families that exist already, but those people who want to come into a fresh are also supported equally to access to sort of the horticultural skills um, because at the moment there's a bit of a bias. We have time for one final question, I think, but we have three. Can we try to take them all and then uh, we, I'll ask uh, the members of the panel to uh, answer all three, if possible, very briefly? <laughs> Please. Uh, Bayan uh, School of Bioscience. I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, education is just very important and we have to start somewhere. Um, but when I hear my daughter coming home from secondary school and in her curriculum she has cooking lessons, she comes home, months working, how to prepare pasta, how to prepare pizza, brownies. <laughs> and later on, years later, she will come back in those big superstores where she can buy all this stuff much cheaper and much quicker to prepare. So there should be a adjustment, very good adjustment between all the very early education, but later on during secondary school and later um, as well. Uh, yeah. Yes, please. I'm Aaron McFickern, I'm the project lead for Community Gateway, which is a university collaboration with Grangetown. Um, mm. And this is a cheeky request for help and advice rather than a question. Um, Community Gateway is taking requests from residents in Grangetown for ideas, and each one we're trying to partner community leads with academic and staff and student leads in the university. One of our key projects is um, a proposal to work with Cardiff Council and partner with Cardiff University local residence groups and um, primary schools in Grangeton to take over a vacant Bowles Pavilion um, and the Bowling Green, a dead end street and a caretaker's house and to develop it for uh, community gardens but also to link it to the primary schools for educational purposes and to develop a community hub and cafe which could take food from the gardens you know, to have kids growing, um, working with the food and eating the food um, as a community hub. So we're really just looking for anyone who could help us. Um, I'm, I'm an architect myself, so I, I know nothing about how to set this up. I know that the residents have already spoken to Sam and we've already spoken to Steve. So we're actually um, fairly close to having an offer from the council that will then take the University Executive Board to try and go into an initial year's partnership um, with a view to taking on a long-term lease mm. and developing the building. So it's a real opportunity to try and work both with academics who are researching in this area and to tie it up with community <coughs> leaders um, in a very long-term strategy. So please come and talk to me if you see I met with Rosie this week. Great. Um, so we had a conversation. What, what I was really excited about was that project. There's also a parallel project that's happening in the community first area in ACE around regenerating a, a building and how to do community service. And I think it would be really interesting to see um, uh, ACE Community First have got a really developed um, community model so that they have a really good community engagement. Um, they've also got a building which they um, need help to develop a vision for <laughs> from an architecture perspective and I think there could be some really good synergies there in two projects. So, yeah.
lots of dissertation topics coming up for the students here. Uh, no time, sorry to continue, at least not formally with. It's 7.30, but obviously feel free to stick around a bit longer, talk to the speakers who I'd like to thank for a really, really useful, interesting, lively discussion. <laughs>